welcome everybody who's tuned in. Um, I will not um, rush too much in making some welcomes and introductory comments uh, to give um, people a chance to join if they're not exactly on time, um, but we will get underway within a minute or two. Um, my name is Brendan Donnell and uh, I've um, been a volunteer member on Engineers for Social Responsibilities Committee for a few years now and uh, it's eventually rolled round to my turn to um, put the president's hat on. So uh, that's currently my role with ESR. Um, and it's uh, a privilege today to have Andre de Groot um, willing to, to speak to us all. Um, we don't often have a, a speaking event in December, but um, with the unique situation we're in with uh, perhaps less competing activities this year than others, uh, especially in Auckland, uh, it's great that we've managed to um, fit this in um, on, on a, what I think would be an interesting and, and really um, timely topic. Um, so to introduce Andre as we kick off, um, I've known Andre for a couple of decades now. Um, he is currently based in Wellington. Um, he's uh, got a Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Auckland um, and then uh, went over to Toronto and got his Masters over there. Uh, he's currently working as a structural engineer. Um, He's worked for a number of consultants in New Zealand and, and in, in North America. Um, and uh, several of his employers, including his current his one, current descended, have, descended have descended from, descended from the Ministry of Works from um, back in the 80s. So uh, that, that'll become topical as we go through the, the, the discussion. Um, and Andre's... Uh, a member of ESR and, and also a number of other um, uh, groups and community um, uh, groups. So he may choose to elaborate more on that as we go through the discussion, but he's certainly very active in, in um, advocating to politicians and, and, and those kind of circles down in Wellington. So he, he's uh, fairly well connected from my perspective down there. Um, so just to lead into introducing Andre's topic, um, his abstract really sets the scene um, of um, us finding ourselves in a, an environment with cheap fossil fuels that gives us uh, almost limitless energy uh, if we can afford it. And um, with the shift to zero carbon economy, we've got a serious challenge on our hands too. Uh, we've made some progress, but um, a lot needed in a very short time. And um, that, that brings us to Andre's topic, uh, which is uh, a proposal for a new Ministry of Works um, as a government engineering organization. Uh, and I, th I think Andre has um, kind of advocated this idea to me for, for some years now, and, and initially it was sort of under the title of a, a Ministry for Sustainable Development. Um, but whatever you call it, the idea is that um, you get some engineers who have um, some resources to be able to achieve um, our emissions reduction goals faster than we would if we... Uh, we're left to market forces. Um, so Andre will, will sort of discuss his idea and and uh, its merits or um, challenges. And then he'll move on to kind of talk, well, what's some examples of what a ministry of works might do? And, and one of those examples speaking from within his area of expertise would be timber buildings. Um, and, and technical development and implementation of that. Um, and then perhaps to, to wrap things up, um, uh, sort of my briefing to Andre would be, it'd be great to sort of have a wider discussion as a group of engineers and, and people interested in the field around the idea of how engineers in general can get traction um, in our advocacy to government, we sort of bring a unique perspective of, of people who are knowledgeable in technical areas and who know th how to get things done. And um, 
uh, that that could be very valuable in our climate response. So uh, it'd be good to hear Andre's thoughts and then open up for discussion about what um, the challenges and opportunities are around that. So um, I will stop, uh, wrap up the introduction now. Uh, just a reminder for anyone who's joined just now, we are recording the meeting. We'll make it available through the ESR website and other places afterwards. Um, I think the meeting settings are that you are able to unmute yourselves, but if I could ask people to keep yourselves muted um, while Andre talks, we'll probably try and wrap things up um, in about 30, 40 minutes um, and then open up for discussion and, and hopefully we're sort of um, wrapping it up around about seven o'clock. Um, but uh, we are a little bit flexible on timing, so if, if people are still keen to keep discussing beyond that, we can we can keep going. Um, and if people need to leave, then by all means, just um, duck out of the meeting. So, uh, Andre, welcome, and I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Uh, so, for those of you who are in, well, have further release from the lockdown for the freedom i'm glad that you've come to listen to me and as brendan said that he's a volunteer well we kind of dream of the day when we can just well when people can be paid directly to tackle our problems if, and we can do it as engineers uh, so that seems to well at the moment it seems to be more of a, a volunteer situation alas Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Right. So as Brendan has said, my talk is about a new Ministry of Works. You could call it a new Ministry of Sustainable Development, although that ends up acronym as being MSD, uh, MSD which we already have one of them, uh, or a Ministry of Green Works. Uh, so first of all, I'll give credit to Julius Vogel, who was an author. He was an author as well as being Prime Minister and behind the Public Works Department. Uh, I would not say that his book, uh, Anno Domini 2000, is the most stunning literature, but it's rather interesting uh, just seeing how someone from the 1800s viewed the future. Uh, so he gives how we could have aeroplanes or helicopters and also a woman's role in the world and he sort of did not see the way the British Empire uh, sort of broke down. But okay, so okay, so from uh, uh, Roslyn Noonan's book, uh, this tracks the expenditure of the Ministry of Works, and you'll see that in the from the 1870s to 1890s, there's a bump. Uh, and then there was a bit of a depression. So the early days, I understand, it was mainly railway building, uh, and then it's sort of had it ups and downs, uh, but well, it basically increased exponentially, like our economy would have been increasing uh, with quite large uh, spending from the 1950s to 1970s. And it's also interesting to see the activities that were done. It's a range with roads and highways and railways being the, along with electrical generation being the largest, along with public buildings, housing, defence and miscellaneous. So some key features I see is that the head of the organisation was an engineer. And I'd so love to see that again. It was able to provide strategic advice to government which seems to have been lost and it worked with academia and industry to develop guidance documents, had a culture of training and learning that the whole industry benefited from and was considered one of the finest public works department in the world. 
But then New Zealand gave up on ambition in 1988. We, in, my, well, in my view, we gave up ambition when we disbanded or broke up the Ministry of Works. So, from Rosalind Noonan's book, Some Problems Encountered with Contracting, uh, this is a quote that the whole system of private contracting fell into such disrepute that Public Works Department Under Secretary Blow could savagely attack it with official blessing in the 1895 New Zealand yearbook. He condemned it for enabling a class of middlemen in the shape of contractors to make large profits, profits out of their undertakings by ill-treating the workmen and by subcontracting work. He argued that the contracting system allowed an anomalous situation to develop where the principal contractor was ruined, the workmen left underpaid, and the local business people who supplied stores and material were unable to recoup the money owing them. Not infrequently, the department was forced to step in, take over, and complete jobs abandoned by contractors. So in many ways, the introduction of the cooperative contract system seemed simply to remove an already redundant intermediary, the contractor. So, so in the late 1900s, uh, 1800s, uh, the Public Works Department employed the cooperative contract system where self-assembled work teams of 10 to 12 men undertook the work. They would select a foreman themselves, pay at agreed rates, and paid slightly more than contractors would pay. And in this way, while the engineers were doing the supervision, uh, and it seemed it was not much more work just to employ the workers directly, rather than having to go through contractors, which were problematic, as you've just heard. Uh, so at the moment, we do, we're do we starting to have growing union support for a new Ministry of Works. Uh, so f First Union engaged Max Harris and Jacqueline Paul to write a report, which is a Ministry of Green Works for Aotearoa New Zealand, an ambitious approach to housing, infrastructure and climate change. So that came out two months ago, uh, and it's an example of a growing movement for a new Ministry of Works. So the areas, obviously there's a large range of areas where it would be useful from electricity. Well, if we're talking like doubling or tripling capacity and adding a huge amount of storage, it's a major undertaking. So three waters, which I don't want to talk about, rail infrastructure, coastal shipping, alternative transport fuels, intermodal transport, housing, public buildings, zero carbon construction, earthquake prone buildings are some areas. Uh, but I want to focus on a few that I see where we really need a step change in uh, in the solutions in terms of how much they cost. Uh, so to be able to take a much more fundamental approach to have large savings. So in terms of climate change and housing, bring affordable housing, it seems that we've only really barely begun with many ideas floated, often unviable, uh, such as the discussions on hydrogen fuel, uh, whether uh, whether these things work or not, we don't know really, and and the projection projections where they do work rely on massive increases in efficiency, in so that it, well in efficiency so that they work far better than they do at the moment. It's a huge challenge to be able to take all that energy that we're getting from fossil fuels that is so easily transported and replace it with alternative ways. And it may well mean that we have to use a lot less energy. So there are challenges which I expect most of you are quite familiar with of energy return on investment and just the overall amounts of energy, the amount of land and money uh, for our new zero carbon world. Uh, so I will touch on housing, lightweight cars, lower cost light rail, major emitters, and engagement with civil society, civil service, and political governance. Uh, so in terms of housing, of, uh, if it's going to be sustainable, we're looking at multi-storey mass timber, which can be, 
well, which is starting to be develop it, developed in uh, British Columbia, other parts of North America and Europe. Uh, so there's potential for it to be very fast to install, well, similar to steel work, but you don't have to pour the concrete floor. So there's technical issues to do with noise and fire. There are solutions to them, uh, but well, like for instance, we don't want to have to cover everything with jib board. It ends up adding significant cost uh, and and changes the look of the timber. And with noise, there's some well elaborate and less elaborate means of reducing noise. Uh, so mass timber can be used for well all elements, all floors, beams, and columns. Um, well, it, it has large it has large gains in using for floors because much of the weight of a modern building is in the concrete floors and if you can use mass timber floors, either CLT or use uh, some form of joist and uh, construction, then you can have large savings in weight and therefore the foundations, the seismic uh, lateral system, uh, transport, it all becomes much easier. And here's another photo. Uh, the Wood Innovation and Design Centre, University of Northern British Columbia. Uh, so there's various attempts at timber buildings. Well, there has been a bit more progress since when I made this slide. Uh, so this was a design for a new, what was going to be a new timber building in Wellington that was going to have a concrete core, uh, but the contractors were unable to give it a fixed price and therefore the developer, which was Bob Jones Holding, did not want to go ahead with the project, so instead decided to just renovate the building that he had on the site. Uh, this is just an example that uh, sort of as you get more into it, what was a architectural, architecturally designed element becomes a engineered element, element and it's quite, it, there can be a lot to take into account. So the more technical engineering you can apply to an element, really the better, which I hope could be done with uh, with the building method I'm going to talk about further. So the basic structure for home building I'd like to see is first of all local teams of architects and planners deciding what is appropriate at an individual place. Uh, they can provide concept designs that then go to an essential engineering team to develop the design shop drawings and manufacturing machine inputs. So at the moment when we uh, do our uh, do our building designs, uh, each one's bespoke, sort of designed individually. We may have some common details, but much of it is designed for that individual building. And then we may do a, well, elaborate Revit model, but often we don't give it to the people doing the shop drawings uh, and the construction people because we don't trust it that it's exact enough to be able to be built from. Uh, so as designers, we usually have little concern for the people doing the shop drawings. We've got no idea how much time it actually takes them to do all the shop drawings and then to be able to create inputs for the, the manufacturing machines. That you, and especially if we go for a more centralised manufacturing, sort of mass manufacturing, which has a lot more inputs, well, into the manufacturing robots. Okay. There's also methods of automation of design and shop drawings, uh, automation of the shop drawings, and methods of automating the construction, uh, the manufacturing. Uh, so you may have heard of Dynamo and you may have heard of Grasshopper. Uh, so they're use it, used in some ways. At the moment, they seem to be used more for fancy buildings. Oh, some automation of repetitive tasks, but there is a huge amount of potential to automate uh, the design processes so that, well, if you could do it for what I'm talking of, you can then spend more time refining each element. Uh, 
so the yeah, if if it's a large scale home building project, then each element can be uh, much more refined. You can also have a central material supply, such as uh, sawmills, or forests even, uh, uh, and then things like CRT or engineered timber manufacture. Uh, then you transport the essentially manufactured uh, building modules to local sites where you have local teams that can, can construct the buildings as well as maintain them, uh, building the skills at a local area. Okay, so the idea of mass customization and productization. So the term mass customization, I take to mean mass manufacture with the ability to make each product customized. So at the moment you do have uh, some houses that are made in factories, but it may just be like say five houses at a time with methods that aren't that different from constructing on site uh, without a high level of sophistication of manufacturing. So an advantage of having a large centralized organization is that it can have much more of a factory or mass production approach. Uh, then the mass, the customization side is that you can use the modern manufacturing efficient methods while still making each individual uh, home or apartment building customized. Uh, so the CNC machines are able to uh, sort of have the individual information for that individual building uh, and customize each individual building. So the product approach uh, I have here where the product is developed by the Ministry of Works and the Ministry of Works is free to choose the characteristics of the product. At the moment the construction people, the people doing the manufacturing have little say over over what, what a building is like. The designs specify all the information. Uh, where most other uh, most other products we buy, well, your cell phone, the consumer is not saying what should be in it. It's the people who know about the cell phones who get to choose what to put in the product, uh, and therefore there's a there's a much well why they give lots of terms and conditions. It's not based on a large amount of contractual specifications in order to uh, buy a product. Well, for cars as well, you don't give them thousands of criteria that you want in the car. Uh, they get to choose and you get to select of, of, of their offerings. So ownership types, there are, well, there are various types of ownership once it is built, state houses, uh, affordable homes, progressive home ownership, institutional rental owners such as NZ Superfund, ACC, KiwiSaver providers, EWI ownership, housing cooperatives. But my focus in this talk is more how to manufacture at a large scale so that the building, that the houses are efficient uh, and affordable. Uh, so, so the form of ownership is then a separate topic. So locations. So I grew up in Browns Bay. Uh, so hopefully you can see from this aerial uh, that there's large amounts of reasonably low-rise buildings that could be uh, rebuilt with well with six to eight-story apartment buildings. Uh, much of the Browns Bay Town Centre is one or two stories, uh, and there's enough playing fields you could even put a reasonable sized high school there. So Manukau, again, you got a few buildings. Uh, I don't know, see, you can see my 
because uh, you, you got a few buildings in like the commercial center you got the train station uh, I think that's the train station you got the shopping mall here and you got a whole lot of low-rise commercial industrial buildings light light industrial uh, with a lot of car parking and Henderson again there's some taller buildings this is the train station uh, but the majority of the Hen Henderson town center to, in my mind is right before putting say six to eight story apartment buildings in so, so where I see the cost savings would be in the ability to engineer and continuously improve each aspect of production to automate processes of design, shop drawings and manufacture, remove the layers of margins from labor that misspelled labor hire subcontractors, contractors and developer fees, address material supply chains, use in-house trained local staff and manufacture in regional New Zealand where costs are lower. Also, multi-story buildings reducing the land component. So, yeah, I'd like a broad invitation for partnering to select sites for sympathetic development, partnerships with iwi, hapu, local government and the local boards, existing landowners, community housing groups and individuals working with their neighbourhoods, a call for land to be respected, land to not be forcibly taken, to serve, not to dominate, a much more bottom-up process than the top-down approach that government is accustomed to, or maybe it is top-down meeting bottom-up in the middle. And a New Zealand Design Inspiration Group, this group will cover insights from Whare Māori Kanga to broader Pacifica design, South Asian Chinese and, and trends from European and North American design, Tangata Whenua design brings a balance between the need for shared space for community and individual private space. Pacifica building design can include larger meeting spaces and better ventilation for hospitality. And many of our peoples value extended family. I also like shared spaces in apartment buildings, green roofs to sit on, barbecues, entertainment rooms, cinema rooms, guest bedrooms, pet rooms. People are happiest when they can find others to be with when they want to and be on their own when they want to. So as to the precariousness of construction as it is now, so in 2001, New Zealand's four biggest construction companies were as below with the year of demise in brackets. Fletcher's stopped vertical construction in 2018. Mainzeal went into liquidation in 2013. Hawkins Construction went into receivership. Hartner went bust in 2001. Downer Construction stopped doing vertical construction in the early 2000s. Multiplex went into liquidation and some more companies will have gone bust since. So we've got margins at the moment at all different levels, uh, sort of increasing the cost. And then with the, construction, with the contracting system, you have costs uh, well, you have the cost of the winning work, cost of not winning work. Senior staff become the salespeople of your company rather than the people doing it. Contracts are inflexible. Contracts have endless requirements. What I've heard of City Rail Link is that each discipline seems to have several thousand contractor requirements that when they look at drawings, they need to be ticking off. So mechanical electrical building services have several thousand, structural have several thousand requirements, architectural have several thousand requirements and that's just, uh, just must add so much extra work for it all. So there are advantages in the alliancing, I'm not sure how much, how many of you are familiar with the alliancing method. This is a project I worked on Memorial Park in Wellington so it is a way to create and deliver organisations quickly, use comment and agreed margins to reduce risk and speed delivery, open books that are transparent, create motivational incentives and a standard approach for large infrastructure projects in New Zealand now. Although City Rail Link is an alliance and that has that that seems to be going down quite a contractual path with all the all the thousands and thousands of contractual requirements. 
So I wonder if that is starting to add costs as it goes down more of a contractual route. But the, well, to me, the key thing about alliancing is it's basically a way of seconding people into organisation quickly. And so it could be used as an initial way to sort of add capacity to an organisation while in the longer term you're trying to build up your own staff. So uh, to employ people directly, so senior staff not bogged down trying to win work and allows planning without the precariousness, strips and costs avoiding the layers of margins, provides strategic leadership for the industry. The Ministry of Works built and can again build technical capacity with the great ability to train staff. Now as to climate change, so myself and Brendan, we were both taught environmental principles by Dr. Carol Boyle. So in 1998, our lecture notes had this chart of, okay, so this chart here of carbon dioxide concentration in atmosphere, and it was going up. Uh, it shows up to 1990 and, well, is the highest state in it. And so it was well known, as I was taught in 1998, that carbon emissions are a serious problem. Okay, so as to a few possible solutions, obviously there's a lot that engineers for social responsibility have been talking about and I just wanted to pick a couple. So one is that electric cars, uh, well basically your cars that weigh a ton and a half just have, uh, just use, it's way more mass than it should have. It uses way, a lot more energy than it should be. And it uses a lot more materials and it means you need a lot more lithium ion batteries. So now much of the complexity of cars is the engine and the drivetrain electric cars are simpler. So New Zealand could develop lightweight chassis and bodies. The car industry base is based on car suppliers, so the car manufacturers do not make all the parts, but you have many car parts suppliers. When I was in Canada I knew about Magma, which was a very, very large supplier of car parts to all the North American car companies. So I think, okay, we have quite a significant uh, recreational stock car and speedway car industry and quite a few people who love to tinker around with their cars and modify their boy racer cars. So I wonder if we would be able to, as, as well as an example to the world, make more lightweight cars. I don't know if we'd be able to make it, them at the mass manufactured uh, large scale, but we could show, we could do the proof of concept. So in, our, in New Zealand we do have a yacht industry that is able to make lightweight yachts. So I show here KZ7 Plastic Fantastic. There was, well there is Hydroflowing America's Cups yachts. So the AC75, well the A75 mass of 6,450 kilograms for a 20.7 meter long vehicle that through wind is able to hydrofoil. Hydrofoiling has been around for quite a few decades now, such as the Pegasus class, which is 237 tons, 41 meters long, and has massive gas turbines to be able to power them. Uh, but yeah, but with lightweight vehicles, even the wind is able to make a vehicle hydrofoil. Uh, there are some other lightweight vehicles. Polaris makes a 612 kilogram off-road vehicle. Uh, and then on the faster scale, you've got your Formula E car, which at 900 kilograms can go at 280 kilometers and travel 160 kilometers well, um, at least before it needs recharging. So, uh, yeah, I think there's potential for cars that weigh somewhere between 200 and 600 kilograms. Uh, otherwise, you're left with, what, scooters or your Tesla-style 
electric car that is overly complex and overly expensive to manufacture when oh, a car doesn't need all the fancy stuff really okay I also I think lower cost light rail so I like light rail because it's a much smoother ride uh, with the longer vehicles you can have the traffic lights turn green every time the vehicle comes uh, but it seems that the way in New Zealand we're trying to approach light rail is by making mega projects. So the Auckland Light Rail, so what we're talking, a 10 to $16 billion project. If we spend that much on a project, we only get to do one at a time, when I really think we should be building like 20 light rail lines across New Zealand. Auckland could do with a good 10 to 15 at the moment, but the problem is the current system, everything just costs so much. Does it really cost that much just to put some tracks in the ground? The reinforcing doesn't really cost that much. The, the 100 year old or 120 year old concrete bases didn't even have reinforcing. The reinforcing in it, you can easily put in enough that would be satisfactory for a bridge of 10 meter span or more with yeah so there must be we know a lot about road pavements and how to analyze them in sophisticated means so we should be able to use that knowledge to be able to do uh, light rail and there is also potential for uh, trains that run on heavy rail tracks and then at the ends use go street running in order to get to town centres to avoid the need for transfers. Okay so with climate change and emissions well in New Zealand we've got what one steel mill one cement kiln uh, we should be able to tackle these much better with a cement kiln I do so I Golden Bay cement kiln in Whangarei I do give credit to that because uh, it has been working with the Ministry for Environment to uh, burn used tyres uh, uh, and it is quite an efficient one we have for Golden Bay and Whangarei where it has the reheaters to reduce the energy usage. Uh, uh, so as to steel production we lost our Pacific Steel Oderhu who steel recycling We've also, well, there's potential for hydrogen to be able to use, be used as a reduction agent. Uh, also, there could be direct electrical processes. And I also wonder if there's potential for uh, carbon capture methods for the cement kiln. It's about seven kilometres away from the uh, Whangarei wastewater treatment plant. And I wonder if you pump carbon dioxide to the wastewater treatment plant, you've got carbon dioxide, you've got the food of the wastewater, you've got light, and you should be able to grow something from that that's useful. Uh, also Huntley, so uh, we've got one, one coal power station. Uh, you, know, you all know about Huntley. So Tarapa Fonterra factory. So this one is combined cycle. I suppose combined cycle is a better type of fossil fuel. Um, but still, really, do we want to use fossil fuels to turn milk to milk powder to export? So you've got the double whammy of the methane from the cows and then the fossil fuels used to dry the milk. Okay, so on to a new Ministry of Works. In terms of climate change, I think it needs to be able to assess ideas and then if those ideas prove promising to be able to develop and then implement them. Uh, whether it's cross ministry or its own ministry and does its own thing. So there's alliancing style secondments and build the number of directly hired staff over time whether the aim is to fill gaps or, and not duplicate effort or just let it duplicate effort because 
we need fresh ideas at this moment and we are not sure what's going to work. So some parallel work streams could make some sense. Okay, in terms of house building, so there's the idea of negative planning. So you give zoning rules allowing a range of developments. The outcome is up to developers. You can upzone a large amount of large area. Uh, and then the developers may or may not build what we want. But really, I'd like to, positive planning to be used where government planners build what they would like to see rather than relying on the free market. Okay, so address transition. Our economy needs to change due to automation, inequality, gig economy, aging workforce, climate change, COVID-19. A new Ministry of Work should include skills such as development economists uh, to help uh, bring jobs to workers as the work changes. In the health space, we're all familiar with Ashley Bloomfield, the Director General of Health is now a public health specialist. Before Ashley, you had a accountant. So if, if for our COVID response, if we can actually have specialists in the relevant field to lead the response, why can't we do the same for climate change in housing. Okay, so as to engaging with like civil service and the, uh, and the political governance and political parties. Okay, so the, 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 there's this term new public management, which I see as the neoliberal approach to civil service. Civil service sees itself as contract managers, contracting as much as possible we have policy advice, which is separated from operational functions. So policy advisors are not the people who have the knowledge from doing it day in, but day out, but they're brought in from outside. Policy advisors and managers move from unrelated department to unrelated department. Individuals try to avoid gaining too much industry specific knowledge as that is being captured by an industry. Each department is standalone with its own culture at the expense of whole of government approaches. Heavy use of consultations is an excuse to not make decisions. It is much work for submitters for unclear results. And then for yourselves who have done submissions, how has your experience in making submissions been? Okay, by political government, political governance, I mean cabinet and its ministers, these are the key people. So ministers' backgrounds are not in setting up Ministry of Works, unless their background is in other areas. Uh, one thing I've heard is the idea that it's not for, like, say, government ministers to ask government departments to look at options for how, what, what could then become a a party policy to go into an election could be like. So it's not their job to do electioneering, which that makes it a whole lot harder for making something that's wholly new if if you cannot use the government resources to to or to develop it at an early stage. So it's unclear what government resources well it's also unclear what government resources we would actually want for to plan a Ministry of Works where I think the knowledge within the Engineers for Social Responsibility uh, is a lot more relevant than uh, than that of more generic government people who haven't been dreaming of a Ministry of Works the way we have and don't have the background in, in the engineering area. Government ministers also have to be very careful in public debates. When they speak it comes across a government policy but external debates do help move the public. So, so it becomes uh, organisations like Engineers for Social Responsibility that are much more able to partake in public debate than public minister than government ministers. Uh, political parties. So there are many members that want to contribute their campaigns into policies. 
Each political party attracts people of certain backgrounds, uh, especially people who have studied political science, if it's Labour, or people who have studied marketing for the National Party, also law for both parties. There is some mix. Uh, so the mix can be more in terms of gender and ethnicity uh, and less in professional mix and there's less engineering representation. Uh, so the question of do we want a separate department for the Ministry of Works, I'm more thinking that now. Uh, if it's a separate department, then it can be truly engineer-led and it can be looking at a more fundamental blue skies approach. Or the various things we'd like to see within a Ministry of Works could be broken down and assigned to current departments such as house building to Kangora, transport to Hakakotahi. Uh, this, uh, the new ideas could go to Callahan Innovation. So an advantage of breaking it down to individual departments is that it is much easier uh, to be able to develop a whole new Ministry of Works. Uh, if it's a whole new Ministry of Works, the time frame is larger than the three-year political cycles. There's also the risk of too many compromises within current government departments if, if they were to be in charge of these, these aspects that we're talking about. So there's challenges. So the pop culture doesn't really connect engineers with climate solutions. Uh, and yeah, and so the people who have more of a generic policy background also don't seem to as much connect engineers with the climate solutions. Uh, I think that these are myths, that it's a scientific problem. Really, it's an engineering problem to solve. It's about individual responsibility. Well, yes, but well, we have, what, one Huntley Power Station, we have one cement kiln, one steel mill. It's, and individuals don't really have much say over those large uh, single emitters. So the idea of market-based solutions like carbon trading, well, even in the construction industry, the building for climate change is looking at means beyond carbon pricing and carbon trading. Uh, well, is it a myth that we're making much progress at the moment? Uh, we don't seem to be tracking down, and it seems like uh, more effort has been done in how to tell the story, how to do the, well, in the public relations than the actual progress. But I think there's opportunity for engineers for social responsibility to work with other groups. And it could, when working with other groups, uh, gain support and awareness. Uh, some possible campaigns would be free public transport. It's not really an engineering one, but it's a much more straightforward policy. Uh, recycle steel again coal-based milk powder. Uh, I don't think the general public realised this fossil fuels is used to create milk powder for export. We know that the electricity market incentivises Huntley Coal, but the general public does not know how the electricity market works. They have not, well, had the talks we have had at ESR and campaigning for new Ministry of Works. So there's quite a few different groups we could be collaborating with, and our members do have connections with quite a few of these different groups. Uh, we do have good connections with unions, Labour Party groups, Green Party groups. Uh, there's the State Housing Action Network that is currently uh, putting forward a petition for an industrial scale state house building program. Uh, there's the group ECO, which is an umbrella group for environmental and conservation organisations in New Zealand. There's also groups such as Action Station, Generation Zero. And that is my prepared talk, so we can now have questions and debate.
let me just change I'll stop sharing and change some of my settings okay well we've still got about 40 people on the call uh, there, there could be a range of questions I think um, it would be good to initially focus on questions for Andre before we perhaps um, you know move into more discussion of, of people making their own points um, so so perhaps for the first five or ten minutes at least we we get people to to raise questions and, and if someone wants to make a comment I, I might just sort of ask you to to hold on to it for for 10 minutes or so um, I'm sure there'll be time for some broader discussion later so I think um, you'll have to be um, onto it with unmuting yourself um, and just jump in um, if if it gets a little bit too much of a lolly scramble I might have to um, ask people to use the raise hand button or something but I think we usually works fine just for us to people to just jump in unmute yourself and ask a question and and um, We'll give that a try. So, anyone want to lead us off? Yeah, can you hear me? Since nobody else is speaking, can I chip in there? Go for it. Okay, I'm Lindsay. Hey, thanks for incredibly stimulating and wide-ranging presentation, Andre. Early on, you mentioned energy return on energy invested. And I think that is a, a, a field that is like the invisible elephant in the energy room, especially when you look at renewables. I'd be really interested to know what you think about the, the way to get that more recognized as a principal factor that has to be considered in the energy transitions that we have ahead. Thank you. Uh, one way is to, for us to create some concise explanations of energy return on investment, but also the overall energy let us, yeah, and with those concise, say, one or two page explanations, uh, there's some government staffers, well, there's some civil service, like people work for MB that we could give it to, uh, Ministry for Environment that we could give it to, and ministers and ministerial advisors we could give it to. Uh, it may also if we could work on some educational material to uh, give to, well, for, for, for start for activist groups, we could do training for activist groups. And then the general public as well. But yeah, so like, we need to put a whole lot more wind turbines up but every wind turbine uses a large amount of steel as long as, well, while we're using steel that uh, uses coal to, to create the steel, steel uh, and also the large amounts of energy, whichever way we do, do it. Uh, sort of, I don't think it's communicated at all much to the general public that it's a massive challenge. I agree totally. Thank you for your answer. Andre, could I ask a question? I was impressed with your um, outlining of modular building construction methods and, and the way that can create innovation and, and in scale and design and that it may be the, we, 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 the government should have announced that if we had that, that what they should put on houses with with um, three sections and three stories or whatever it was three houses on three with three stories on sections across the whole country what they should have announced was 
that people should be able to put modules of various forms to the effect that uh, we add further accommodation, but we achieve in these modules certain design requirements. It seems like the opposition to this proposition has been that uh, they would all look ugly like ugly great big freeze block monoliths and we don't want that. But they almost invited us to think about that by the way they announced the plan. What we could have done is is had a ministry which or a, or, a, or an available catalogue of modules which could be shown to have design features built into them such as warm and dry space for uh, a deck, um, not not look cluttered up and, and jammed together, uh, able to fit the shape of the of the site, whatever that might be, uh, and therefore be more appealing in terms of a way of trying to intensify housing. I quite liked your idea that the modules might be a, a flexible way of achieving that, and I think we could push that issue further. Yeah, and so I'd, uh, I'd love to see uh, sort of Ministry of Works manufacturer that is able to sell to the general public and have the customization uh, make it customizable uh, as to what government also could be saying well uh, there's a lot of things that have been done for kang aura and well, burning houses that has not been communicated to the public much at all uh, one of them is that i understand there's four large contracts for modular construction already given by Kang Aura so that four companies are able to try to uh, build uh, uh, build some expertise and well, factories and have security of uh, of contract with that uh, I think the general public don't know that I don't I think people I don't think many people know at all uh, but I'd like a much larger scale than these current four contracts would be. I remember talking to Bill Mackay about uh, the construction of villas in, in Auckland over the in the early part of last century and, and how many of those villa designs are actually um, modules bought from Californian construction companies. They've already been prefabricated in California and even using New Zealand timber, which was now being sent back as a um, bay window or as a, a, a lounge or a, or a, you know, a um, porch kitchen unit. They were already prefabricated. Yeah, and, and as to how, so for when we started building state houses, how much of that was just a continuation of the railway houses? So the New Zealand Railways built their own houses, which would have been modular uh, and would have been put up in some uh, very out of the way places. Thank you, Andrew. Andre, I wonder if you could throw out a couple of comments on, on um, reasons for optimism that the government uh, around yeah, I had a, um... oh no carry on oh i'll carry on um i guess around the idea from minister of works um what's sort of acting in its favor is something that might happen and things that aren't acting in its favor that that might might kill the idea any comments on that well i've heard that uh, from the Labour Party policy side, or like the party member policy side, uh, that uh, that proposals for a new Ministry of Works have gone through the party side and have been passed by the party. Uh, so you'd still have the government ministers to have to buy into that. Uh, as yeah, you have unions pushing for it. Uh, well, I've not heard from the Green Party specifically, but I think they would like uh, if it's that it could be quite different. Uh, you do have the 
that state house building coalition, which hopefully will uh, give us some steam in the push for, or they say, an industrial building of state houses. So uh, yeah, I understand that enough of the government ministers are familiar with the idea and must be thinking about it. Thanks. Uh, it looked like Megan was wanting to raise a question. Do you want to jump in now, Megan? Yeah, hi there. Um, sorry, I'm out, so there's a little bit of background noise. Um, my question for you was just, um, if we're looking at a new Ministry of Works from a systems perspective, would you envision that a lot of research and development would be involved as well to actually feed through into those continuous improvements from the, from the Ministry? Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, yeah, and much sort of classic connection than we have at the moment between design and, well, the research. Uh, yeah, we want to do things differently from the way we are at the moment, and we want to be able to, well, definitely need a lot of research. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was that was my thoughts as well. Just um, particularly around, uh, I mean, going back to that re energy return on energy invested conversation, that that needs to be in the future expanded to include all emissions rather than just from energy. As mm -hmm. as the grid becomes more and more decarbonized, and as energy becomes more decarbonized, we likely need to move on to different sources. Yeah, and there's enough ideas that sort of we're close to, but. We're not quite there and we need a bit of research and development in order to make them work. Uh, and, Could I? Well, so oh, in, in the past, our earthquake engineering research was excellent. Uh, and I think a big part of that would have been with the Ministry of Works uh, pushing it and then getting government funding for universities. Uh, and doing a lot of the work for the new standards, so not relying on volunteers from from private industry so much. Cool, thank you. I have a question, if that's all right. Um, Andre, early on in your talk, you um, said something like, um, in places where they do innovation, and showed a wooden building in Canada, I think. Um, I wondered if you'd like to talk a bit more about what's gone wrong in New Zealand that we don't do innovation. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so, well, for construction, it's easiest to use your last design and you may make a few small changes uh, but there's not the there's no real incentives for the designers to do something radically different uh, and there's no money for that uh, it's economic to go with what you've previously done uh, also without the testing research and development uh, it's much harder to know that it's trustworthy, that we can depend upon our designs. Uh, or if you go too different from what's currently done. Uh, and while well, there have been examples of people who have uh, been quite suppose, creative and it's gone wrong. Uh, and then when it comes to making things more cost effective, uh, there's no incentives for the designers to, well, there's some incentive, but really not that much. We don't get paid according to construction savings. Uh, and then for the construction companies, they're not doing the design, they're just tendering against or competing with each other to do the designs done by other people. Uh, so there's not their vertical integration where 
the construction companies benefit from uh, the innovative design. Uh, well, you may see some vertical integration like Fletcher's, but still we're not, I don't think we're seeing, yeah, as we're quite slow moving forward. Uh, our design standards for buildings are all pre-Canterbury earthquake. Uh, we do have some knowledge and there's been, well, some amendments to fix some serious problems, but even our design standards for buildings uh, sort of, as, yeah, the pre-Canterbury earthquake. Just... So do you think it's a fundamental issue with the market approach to doing everything in construction? Yes, definitely, yes. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, the Ministry of Works was able to drive innovation in the past and is able to do the research and development for that to happen. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> right, yeah. Yes, Dave, if you unmute yourself. Yeah, I was just thinking, Andre, um, if the Ministry of Works or organisation like, like the Ministry of Works really wanted an example of what they could do, all they need to do is compare it to the shambles, which is the transmission gully, which is years behind and still going through countless um, cost increases. Uh, and also the um, Pika Pika to Otaki motorway, which I... Um, pass every day or have nearly every day for the last two years that's um, so slow it's almost like a caterpillar <clears throat> um, I would think the ministry that those would be great examples to show the the virtues and the benefits of having <clears throat> having one cohesive team to um, engineer and scientists led to uh, do this sort of development yeah so what you haven't seen with those projects is sort of building one local team that just goes from project to project to project. You've seen, well, the transmission gully started before uh, before people had finished at Mackay's to Pekka Pekka. You have the largest project ever that comes as transmission gully that comes like out of nowhere and then have to bring in staff from elsewhere uh, or the additional costs of bringing in staff from overseas and the loss of the opportunity for local people to work on it. Uh, I also wondered why a transmission gully would have a finished date at the end of winter. Uh, the only explanation I can understand is that maybe in Australia you were able to do road surfacing uh, in winter, uh, but it does. I have heard that the, per the people who promised the completion date in winter have since left the project so they're not the ones who have to finish in winter and now it is looking like uh, with COVID being a good excuse uh, they will manage to uh, have a good summer to be able to complete the project in the newspapers you hear that uh, it has resource consent uh, and QA testing to be done before they'll let people use the road. For some reason, they don't mention you have to finish the surfacing and the road marking and additional road furniture before you can open the road. Uh, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> it's certainly been a shambles. <laughs> well, I, I, I thought that, like, the whole point, okay, the, the point of a PPP. Well, the point of contract, well, the point of PPPs is so that private capital has an opportunity to make money off government co contracts. Uh, the point of government contracts in the first place is so that private contractors can make money through government. Uh, and that's the point of private consultancy as well, as far as I see. Uh, but the point of, from the government side of having a PPP is to be able to really nail down costs so that you, well, as an extension from a design build, so that 
the contractor has very little opportunity to claim more costs. But somehow with Transmission Gully, the contractor st still has been able to uh, claim huge additional amounts of money. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll probably um, look to wrap it wrap up the discussion. It's been uh, really great. Uh, lots of good questions and, and, and thoughts coming through. I just wonder if we might steer it in the way of a bit of an open discussion of people jumping in um, around uh, the impact that ESR specifically, but engineers in general, can have on uh, poking government, prodding government to take stronger action on on emissions reduction in particular. Um, you kind of mentioned in your talk, Andre, the frustration of, of endless emissions, which uh, you're not never sure what impact they're having, um, and, and a bit of a disconnect um, where no one's really looking to engineers for answers to the problem. Um, so maybe you've got some thoughts to kick us off around, and you probably already shared some as well, around what what do you think is an engineer or an engineering so uh, society's um, best value for time to to invest our efforts in to to try and be a catalyst for change? And uh, once Andre's commented, other people might want to jump in. Yeah. So first, I think so. While we've got the individual policies, individual topics, uh, I think it it shows the need for more for, for an organization in order to uh, carry out those policies rather than having to engage with uh, the civil service as it is at the moment uh, i think there's I, th I think there's ways to uh, send uh, reports or or messages to people, well, civil servants and also government ministers and their policy advisors directly, which I think could be more effective, but also working with the, uh, working with activists, educating the activists. Uh, they have certain skills, but uh, they don't have the type of uh, technical understanding we have, and so we could be of quite a lot of use to them. Well, for a start, you can talk to your local, I suppose, Greens or Labour MP asking for the Ministry of Works. Uh, the backbenchers have more time. Uh, they're more accessible, usually. Uh, the, the government ministers, when they become ministers, you don't see them as much. Uh, opposition MPs can be quite good as well. Uh, but once they go into government, you don't expect to see them. May I chip in, please, Brendan? Go for it. Apologies if my signal's not so good. Tell me if it's breaking up too much, please. We've got a lot of wind. Um, Andre, I, that's a wonderful sweep that you've covered. I've, I've got a couple of suggestions, or one suggestion in response to your comment about engineers, I think one of the things that government is conspicuously lacking on is the ability to really visualize scenarios for the long-term future or medium-term future. And I think some sense of a destination, not three years or five years, but 50 years out or a lot more, is a very important part of it. So that's point one. But I also, I'm going to put on a hat, I'm an architect. <laughs> now, I'm not for a moment thinking architects should be strongly in the mix you're talking about, but I do did find myself feeling like I was a, standing with one foot on the wharf, which was agreeing with all the problems, and one foot on the boat that was leaving, which was, it's all about engineers. <laughs> and I actually disagree with you that it's such an engineering-centric situation, and two reasons. One, I think it's actually more of a project management situation now a lot of engineers are wonderful project managers but not all are 
<laughs> and I think also we still have some engineering solutions that are quite inappropriate, especially in a climate sense. For example, there are still highways being built with the myth that arterial feeders will ease congestion. And that's still put up as an argument to build another arterial feeder and so on. So I'd like to just frame it that I agree with a lot of what you say, and I really think engineers are, are central to it, but I don't see it as being quite such an exclusively engineering or technical problem. Um, for example, change managers, I think, have a place as well, and, uh, and several people in the social sphere. I've rabbited on enough. I think you see where I'm coming from. Um, I'd be very interested in comments around that broader spread of engagement of skills. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely in terms of, uh, well, especially buildings, but well, changing lifestyles as well. Uh, and, yeah, we, we're talking a lot of behavioural change for lowering emissions as well, of well buildings that are built so that your lifestyle uh, is looks quite different from how it is now. Uh, yeah, well, obviously this is a talk to engineers. Uh, it's interesting that the, uh, uh, the sort of paper by Max Harris and Jackie Paul uh, sort of barely mentioned, I don't think it mentioned it. Well, it, it, the proposed structure had sort of the chief architect as the, on the design side, and then the engineers were relegated to construction rather than like a head office design. But I, yeah, we, uh, yeah, it's definitely multidisciplinary uh, development economists as well. Uh, my, my question was not about trying to elevate the role of architects, which I, I don't think we have a good track record at all in the project management field, but was more about the fact that there are other players quite independent of building and so on. Uh, but thank you for your answer anyway. Could I just add to that? Um, also, scientists might feel a bit put out uh, when you're talking about climate change, um, where they could, as well as architects, would have an equal access, I would think, to any Ministry of Works or derivative of thereof. Thank you. Well, when I talk to the former Commissioner of Works, Bob Norman, who, alas, has passed away now, uh, so uh, he talked of quite a strong connection with DSIR and the scientists there. Uh, so when he was Commissioner of Works, and, yeah. Any final comments or conversation points anyone wants to jump in with? No? Well, um, that being the case, uh, we've probably you've gone well into time and some people have dropped off, but um, let's wrap it up there. Um, I want to say a big thanks to Andre, Andre for his time preparing to do this, and I know it's a busy time for him as, as for many of, many of us at the moment, so uh, thanks very much for um, making the time, putting it aside to, to present to us, Andre, and, and um, yeah, I found it really wide-ranging and, and quite interesting food for thought um, to think about the potential of a Ministry of Works and, and, and more broadly than that, um, the role that us as engineers and uh, other disciplines can play um, in, in solving the climate crisis. So, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we will, uh, we're intending to launch into our meeting program for 2022 with our AGM in March next year and we've got speakers lined up to talk about um, 
tidal power, tidal power generation. So uh, that'll be an interesting topic to, to kick the air off next year. So stay tuned for that and have a great, have a great um, summer. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Andre. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.